Hallelujah. 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 Two lessons that were read to us from the book of Leviticus and the book of Hebrews are exactly summed as thus. One might as well be called the Old Testament and one the New Testament. One the Old Commandment, the second the New Commandment. One speaking of the law and the imperfection of the priesthood. And the second one speaking of the Spirit and the perfection of the priesthood of Christ that was ordered after Melchizedek. And when you read the book of Hebrews 7 and from 11 it says, If therefore perfectual by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? And the first lesson, the Lord has given instruction to Aaron and to the Levites and to all the priests that will come in the order of Aaron that this is how the priesthood is to be conducted. And as we read, I heard some people shudder because the commandments were so rigid the expectation of that man who enters into the holiest part of the temple was so strict. It was impossible for man to prepare and do all that. They had to keep themselves so blameless, so spotless. They couldn't touch a dead body. They couldn't be defiled. They couldn't mourn for their own people. But unfortunately, the person who was entering into the inner altar was also a sinner like all the others. So he had to bear offerings for his own sins first before doing it for others. And sometimes when the priest was dead, there was no way to find out except there was a rope they used to tie to the leg of the priest. They used to go all the way outside the temple. So if the priest is taking too long, they start to yank the rope. If it doesn't respond, they know he's dead. But because nobody can go in there, they drag him out. And the Lord observed. And said, even the priests that I've called are imperfect. Their minds are calloused. They're full of sins and iniquity. The laws I've given to the people, all they have done is fallen, and I've had to destroy them again and again. You heard what he said to do to a woman who defiled the priesthood of our father by her behavior. And God said, I can't keep creating these people only to destroy them. Something must be changed. So God observed us. God observed the original order and saw that something was broken and said, I have to change something. Which then brings us to today's lesson. Yeah. That Hebrews 7, you read from verse 15, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment but now after the power of an endless life. And from verse 18 it reads, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before, meaning the old commandment was now disannulled and completely rendered null and void. And why? Because it was weak and it was unprofitable. Says verse 18, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. And when you go to Romans, Chapter 8 from verse 3. For what the Lord could not do. For what the Lord could not do. For what the Lord could not do. In that it is weak. In that the law was weak. Through the flesh. Through the flesh. God sent in his own God son. God sent in his only son. In the likeness of sinful In the flesh, likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin. And for sin. Condemned sin. Condemned sin in the flesh, yes. That what? The righteousness of the law. That the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us. May be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the Who flesh? Who walk not after the flesh? But after the spirit. But after the spirit. So here is my question then. If the Lord is saying that he observed that there was something wrong with the old order, and that he decided to make a change, he observed that the old Levitical priesthood and the laws that were given did not change man, but in fact brought more condemnation upon man. 
and he decided to make a change, why then do we fail to make the same observations? Somebody go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, and read from verse 20 to 21. And though the Lord, the Lord give you the bread of adversity. I want you to listen to this. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity. And the water of affliction. And the water of affliction. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But, yes. thine, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers. I want you to think about this. Although I give you what? Bread of, bread of the bread affliction. of affliction and what? And the water of affliction. And the water, the bread of adversity bread. and the water of affliction, but your teachers will no longer be hidden in the corner, but now you shall see them and observe them with your eyes. Now what's the Lord saying? He's saying we are no longer paying attention. He's saying that we are not paying attention to what we are being taught. And what he means by that is a lot of us see our afflictions, we see our troubles, the people who cause us trouble, and we see them not for the teaching the Lord is trying to instruct us. He said you will no longer have your teachers hidden, you will see them with your eyes. Men and I that have been going around believing that because this trial or tribulation has fallen upon me, something is wrong, and therefore I'm asking God, why me, O oh Lord? Because I have a problem with Mr. A or Ms. B or Ms. C, and I think this person is wicked, this person is evil, this person is trouble, I can't stand this. The Lord is saying the time will now come when I will open your eyes. And which eyes is he talking about? Ephesians 1.18. When I will open your eyes and you will now see your teachers. What does it mean by teachers? Yes. The eyes of... Continue. The eyes of your understanding being the enlightened. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So that now when you see trouble and affliction, the bread of adversity or what's of affliction, you don't look at it for the trouble it is. You look at it for the teaching the Lord is instructing you. They are no longer just adversity. The Lord says they are your teachers. The thing that is causing you affliction, causing you sorrow, that thing that you desire, that thing that you want, that you seem to not get, the disappointment, the betrayal, the insult, the humiliation, he is saying they are your teachers. And I need you to observe and to understand what they are trying to teach you. Once the eyes of your understanding have been enlightened, you will now start to see what is really going on in the world. Because a lot of us go around and we think we understand God. We think we know what God is trying to say. But God is saying you must observe what is going on. The same way God observed what was going on and changed the Levitical order. And changed the priesthood. From a priesthood that died to the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, other than Christ, is the only person mentioned in the Bible who had no beginning and had no end. Because it was Christ himself. And that is why he was called the king of Salem. He was the same priest that Abraham met on his way back. And that was the first time Abraham gave a tenth of everything unto him. That was the first appearance of Christ in the book of Genesis. And now God gave him a priesthood that will never end. So the same way the Lord is not saying, why don't we observe this? Isaiah 11, 2. From verse 3. Then this is what I'm saying. Why do we say there has to be a different priesthood? I want you to think about something for a moment. And the spirit of Hold that thought for a moment. Consider the people around you. Consider somebody who offends you. Somebody who aggravates you. Somebody who is a thorn in your flesh, as we call it. In your opinion, that person is wicked. In your opinion, that person is what? Evil. In your opinion, that person is selfish. But that is only your opinion. And that opinion is based on one thing and one thing only. Your personal experience with that person. Even if five more people or ten more people or the entire congregation shares that opinion, it doesn't make it the opinion of God. It doesn't make it the opinion of God. Because when you think about it, the entire world condemned Jesus as a sinner and as a thief. 
and yet we're all wrong. The entire world took a stone and was ready to condemn that adulterous woman. And yet Jesus saw in her righteousness and saved her. Peter <coughs> caught the ear of Malchus, who was the slave of the priest that came, because he thought that was what he deserved for being associated with that priest. And he said, Jesus restored the air and saved him. So your opinion of people has nothing to do with God's opinion of them. You may think they are evil or they are wicked. And in God's eyes, they are far more righteous than you. The question you should be asking is, what is this person in my life supposed to be teaching me? Why does God allow me to be aggravated by this person? What is this aggravation teaching me? What is this affliction teaching me? What is this discomfort teaching me? For some people, even your spouse has been put in your life as a teacher. Our children are put in our lives as teachers. The colleague you cannot stand is put in your life as a teacher. But the problem is, nobody ever asks. What are you trying to teach me, O oh Lord? Instead, we revert back to the flesh, to the carnal mind, and we start to say, oh, this person is this, this person is that. They have nothing to do with it. The question is, what are they teaching you in your life? Yes, on Isaiah 11, from verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord yes. shall rest upon him. Yes. The Spirit of wisdom yes. and understanding. Yes. The Spirit of, of counsel yes. and might. Yes. The Spirit of knowledge yes. and of the fear of the Lord. Yes. And shall make him of quick understanding. And shall make him of quick understanding. In the fear of the Lord. In the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge. He will not judge. After the sight of his eyes. After the sight of his eyes, which is what you do. Neither improve. He will not reprove. After the hearing of his ears. Not even after what he hears, which is what you do. Oh. So think about it. If all the things, the basis on which you condemn or judge people, are not even the basis Christ will use, then how can he reach the same conclusions you do? You judge based on feelings, reactions, what you see, what that person has done, what you have heard. Christ said that has nothing to do with me. Your reaction has nothing to do with me. The fact that that person provokes you has nothing to do with that person's righteousness before me. Mary Magdalene was exiled because she had a legion, seven different demons inside her. She was deemed unfit to be amongst the people. And yet Jesus saw her and delivered her and made her a zealot for his name so much so that she was the first person he revealed himself to into his resurrection. Do you really think God sees the way you see? Do you think God judges the way you judge? But yet we insist on following the old priesthood of the flesh, the carnal mind. And Christ says, I am the new priest. And the new priesthood follows after the spirit, not after the flesh. And you must pay attention to your teachers. You cannot claim to have fellowship with Christ if you're not partaking in the behavior of Christ. Imitatio Christi. You cannot claim to be a part of Christ if you're not imitating in your life the very livelihood, personality, and the expressions of Christ. Philippians 2 says what? So the point now is, if we have no fellowship with Christ, we cannot claim to be of Christ. Philippians 2 tells me something from verse 1. It says, if there be therefore any, there consolation, be any consolation in Christ, in Christ yes, if, any comfort of love, if there is any consolation in Christ, meaning, if indeed you find out that the life and death of Christ indeed brings into your life any consolation. If you believe his life and death has served any purpose in your life, yes. If any fellowship of If any comfort of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, yes. If any bowels of and mercies, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye, fulfill my, ye my joy, by what? That ye may be like-minded. That ye may be like-minded as Christ. And verse five says what? Let, let this one, mind, let this mind be let in this you, mind be in you, which was also in which Christ was Jesus. also in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Let this mind be in you, which was also what in Christ Jesus. Now the book of Luke, chapter twenty-three, from verse forty-four to forty-six. I want us to see the process of transformation here for a moment. 
Luke 23 from 44 to 46. And, and it was about... about and it was about the sixth hour. And it was about the sixth hour. And there was a darkness over all the earth. And there is a darkness, a thick, terrible darkness over the entire world. And this is what happened. The moment you're about to undergo a transformation in Christ, there must be darkness. Meaning everything you thought you knew must now be completely blinded. Do you remember what first happened to Saul on his way to Damascus? When Christ called to him, what happened to him? He was blinded. There must be darkness because everything Saul thought he knew, the Lord had to first destroy. He continued. Unto the ninth hour. Unto the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened. The sun was darkened. And what does the sun represent? The light by which you have seen, seen the world. The way you have been seeing the world. The knowledge which you have been seeing the world. The way you have been responding to your neighbor. The way you have been responding to your teachers. Responded in the flesh, reacted in the flesh. Oh, this person has helped me, I can't forgive, and I'm pulling back. I have forgiven, but I can never be associated with this person. I want nothing to do with these people in this church. I want nothing to do with my sister. I want nothing to do with my brother. I want nothing to do with that person. And yet we claim fellowship with Christ. He says, first of all, there must be darkness. And the light of the sun was darkened. Men in the light by which you have been seeing the world must first of all be darkened. Why? Revelation 21. From verse 23. The Lord is talking about the new city. He says, the city has no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is what? The light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. If you are going to be saved, you must walk no longer in the light of the sun of your thinking. You must walk in the light of Christ. That's the way you have to see things. That's the way you have to see the world. Unless you are doing that, you have no fellowship with Christ. And the second thing that happened. Matthew 27 from verse 51. He says, And behold, the veil of the temple was what? Rent in twain from the top to the bottom. That is the old priesthood. The old thinking. The Lord destroyed it completely. This is why Christ was doing it. He said he rent that veil completely in twain. The veil that covered the inner temple where the priest used to go where nobody could look into. Christ tore it apart. And I exposed it and said, this is unworthy and unfit of leading my people back onto the glory of God. He rented in twain from the top to the bottom. And he says, the earth did quake and the rocks were rent. And when he says the earth, who is the earth if not you and I? When you undergo a transformation, there must be a violence happening in your mind. Because your mind is attacking your heart and your heart is taking up insurrection against your mind. And saying the way I've been thinking about things is no longer the same. Something must be different. There must be a quake. There must be a violence. Well, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence in the time of John the Baptist. And what? The violent lay hold of it. There must be violence. And then he said something. He says, and the rocks. Oh, heavenly father. Matthew 13, 5. In the parable of the sower. He tells me something about the rocks. Some fell upon stony places. He says, some fell upon stony places. Where they had not much earth. Where they didn't have much earth. And forthwith. And forthwith. They sprung up. They sprung up. Because they had no deepness of earth. Because they had no what? Deepness, deepness of earth. They had no deepness of earth, yes? And when the sun was up. But when the sun was up. They were scorched. They were scorched completely. And because they had no root. And because they had no root. They withered away. They withered away. Thank you. He says there was no deepness. And there can be no deepness where there is a rock. There can be no deepness where there is a stone. So the Lord is telling you where you have been thinking in your shallow mind. I know Christ. He says unless you desire to know Christ, even at a deeper level. Nothing can ever grow there. The rock that is in you. This is the way I've always done it. This is who I am. This is my thinking. I can't change. Why must I change for people? Unless that rock is broken, you're fooling yourself. You can't undergo any transformation. Nothing can grow. 
It says that because it was shallow, the seed took and it grew very quickly because the roots didn't have to search very far to find out. He says, but once the sun came up, it withered because the root could not sustain because it was in shallow land. And many of us cannot sustain because we are shallow thinkers. And I'll show you what we mean by that. Luke 5 is going to be the basis of what we discuss everything today. And you go from Luke 5, you see the entire process of invitation and transformation. And it came to pass. And it came to pass, from verse 1. That as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. As the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. Why people pressing upon him to hear the word of God? Because there is a famine. There is a famine today not of the word of God. There is a famine today not of churches. But there is a famine of Christians expressing and devastating Christ. People are looking for Christ in us but do not see him. People are looking for Christ in churches, but they cannot find him. All they see are other human beings who are claiming to be Christ, but are nothing like this Christ. Like Gandhi said, I love your Christ, but I see nothing in you Christians that demonstrate your Christ. Continue. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret, yes. And saw two ships standing by the lake. He saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them. But the fishermen were gone out of them. And I want us to take that for a moment. He saw two ships standing by the lake, and the fishermen were what? Gone were gone out of them. You see, these two ships, number one, a ship isn't meant to be on the shore. A ship on the shore is safe, is it not? But that's not what a ship is built for. A ship is built for the ocean. For the deep end of the ocean. To brace the storms. To brace the tempest. But here these two ships were. Sitting on the shore. But something also happened. They were both empty. <coughs> the fishermen were gone. They had done their part. They had gone looking for fish in all the places they looked for fish, and they couldn't find anything. And that's modern day so-called Christians. We come to church, we do our part, we praise, we worship, we pay our tithes, we sing, we dance, we rejoice, we pray for one another, and then we leave. We're done. Some of us may even read our Bible on the weekday, but that's the extent of it. Oh, we give alms when we see people on the streets. And we say we have fulfilled Christianity. But is this really what Christ is asking us to do? Or is he demanding more? And you'll see where he's demanding more. And then Christ did something when he saw the two ships. What did he do? He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. He entered into one of the ships, which was whose? Simon's. Simon's. And I find myself thinking. And I asked my father, I said, Lord, why did you choose the one ship over the other? And at the end of the day, the Lord said only one thing. When you see two ships and Christ chooses one, he chooses one only for one reason and one reason only. Book of Revelation, is it 3.20 says, well, Behold, I stand at the door knocking. Yes? If anybody hear my voice and open, I will what? Come in and sup with him and he and my father also with him. He knew that that boat belonging to Simon belonged to a man that was open-minded. A man that would not resist him. A man that would not resist his teaching. A man that would not resist the foolishness of Christianity. So that was the boat he entered. He stands knocking at the door of many of our minds and hearts. But he cannot come in. Christ cannot walk through a closed door any more can his word enter into a closed mind. And this is why he chose that one ship. Because he knew this one belongs to Simon Peter. Simon Peter will not refuse me. Simon Peter will not refuse my word, no matter how foolish my instructions may be. But many of us reason with God and we try to explain to wisdom itself why what he's asking us to do doesn't make any sense. There's a sea standing in front of me, and you're telling me to walk through it. 
My only son that I've waited for for 40, 50, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years. You're going to tell me to go sacrifice him? Doesn't make any sense, Lord. You know better. Well, what is Christ trying to tell us? At the end of the day, that ship was empty and he got into one. And what did he say then? And prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. He prayed him one thing, thrust out a little out of the land. That is what Christ does when you first come to him, isn't it? He doesn't burden you with discipleship. He only burdens you with followership, baptism, repentance. Come to Christ. Read your Bible. Come to church. Worship me. Thrust out a little from the land. I'm not going to trust you into the deep quiet yet. And let's see how you respond to that. So he did. And then afterwards, what happened? Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Yes. Launch out into the deep. And let now he said to Simon, Launch out onto the deep. And let down your net. And let out. down your net for a draft. And this is where most of us now begin to fail. Because when Christ tells us, launch out into the deep, we say it's too deep. Because when Christ says launch out into the deep, he's asking you something. He said the first time he says thrust out into the land, it's like a marriage. That's the honeymoon period. When the little things count. Oh, he bought me flowers. We're celebrating. Our I remember when Deji was getting married. I, I wanted to slap his face one day. Oh, we're celebrating our three month anniversary. Our two month anniversary. Our nine month anniversary, our ten and a half month anniversary, our eleven month anniversary. But that's the beauty of it, because everything is new. The things you focus on, did he pull out the chairs for me? Does he write me love letters? Did he tell me I'm beautiful this morning? I did. Yes, did, exactly. This morning, this afternoon. But the point is, that's where marriage is. Initially, those are the little things that count. But then the second part, when Christ now tells you thrust out into the deep, he's telling you this is now different. Real life hits you. You start to understand the differences in your personalities. Suddenly he snores like a whale. Her voice sounds like a screeching animal. I can't stand this, I can't stand that. Oh, I don't like the way she walks, I don't like the way he talks. He farts or she farts in her sleep. All the crazy things now start to drive you crazy. I think Uncle Steve is laughing because he's good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the point is, things start to change. Kids enter into the equation. You now start getting frustrated. Bills come into the equation. You now start getting frustrated. Real life has taken over what you thought was the honeymoon period. Now you're less concerned about who opened the door that much more did you pay the PSMG bill. <coughs> I had a friend once and I said, what do you do for your wife for Valentine's Day? He goes, as soon as I walk in the house, I call her and I say, stand here. And she stands there and I say, happy Valentine's Day, honey. And I flip on the switch and the light comes on. I say, as long as the light is on, I've given you a Valentine's Day present. <laughs> But he says it jokingly. But this is how he starts to transition. But Christ is now telling Peter, launch out into the deep because I want you to change the way you think. There was a time it was okay for you to get angry. It was okay for you to say, these people are causing me provocation. The preacher said, I'm not going to forgive this person. For you to actually deal in jealousy and pride and all those things. But he said now that I'm asking you to thrust in the deep, I'm taking you from fellowship or fellowship, I want to make you a disciple. And as a disciple, I'm teaching you now, you must pay attention to your teachers. You can't see Mr. A who continues to provoke you as Mr. A provoking you. Ask Christ, what are you teaching me? Remember the Lord is trying to teach you patience. Oh, I hate drivers that drive slow. And there was a day I was driving and somebody was beeping the horn and flashing and flashing. It was one lane. I'm like, what do you want to do, fly? And suddenly he went around and all I saw was this. <laughs> Who looks like a madman between here now? I couldn't hear a word he was saying. But this is what many of us do. Because Christ is not saying, rather than you saying they're driving like crazy people, saying, what is Christ teaching you? Patience. 
when you say somebody is provoking you, what is Christ teaching you about yourself? That you must still master your own provocation. Because if you're my disciple, you will be provoked night and day and you cannot respond to it. Because it is not the people doing it, it is Satan I have sent to teach you that message. Paul said three times I prayed unto Christ, take this message of Satan from me. The Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. He said it was a thorn in his flesh. And a lot of us refuse to grow. We are like children who want to remain in kindergarten our entire lives. And the Lord is saying, move, grow. There is more I want to teach you, but you cannot find me in the shallow end. You have to move to the deep end. First he says, first half from the land. Then he said, now do what? Go out into the deep. Where you cannot let your nets down. And you see, you think about it. If they let their net down, they can catch fish. If you pitch your net up, you prevent the fish from coming in. The fish we're talking about here is the true knowledge and wisdom of Christ. Unless you let that God down, you cannot receive Christ into you. Unless you change the way you've been thinking, you cannot begin to see Christ differently. Ask yourself once. Because we get so comfortable. If you're comfortable in your Christianity, you're not doing it right. Imitation Christi. You must imitate Christ. Am I imitating Christ? But you know what we do? We give ourselves a pass mark. We start to say, well, Christ knows me. Well, this is all I can do. We start looking at ourselves in relative goodness to others. Well, at least I'm not like so and so. At least I do this, I do that. Instead of looking at us in relative wretchedness to the goodness of Christ. We're always looking at the other person and thinking how much better at least we're doing it. But if you look at Christ, you will realize how wretched you are at every step. This is what Christ is asking us to do. Long child into the deep. There's a New Balance slogan that says, dare to go beyond your limits. Don't settle for the limits of the way you've always been thinking, the way you've been seeing the world. Change it up. And say, okay, how can I see this differently? What is God really teaching me? What are my teachers instructing me here? Is it a trial or a tribulation? When Job, in one day, lost everything he had. Wife, children, possession. The things that wasn't taken by his enemies was killed either by disaster or was killed by fire. One servant came with bad news. The next one came with worse news. The third one came with even far worse news. Job responded to his friends because they provoked him. But God was trying to reveal something in Job that you still have a pride and indignation in you that must be killed. Because they provoked him so much, he now started to condemn God. And God said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words that knowledge? He said, would you condemn the Lord to justify yourself? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you you will answer me. The Lord was teaching him. Those disasters were not just disasters. They were teachers. How to endure on the tribulation. To understand, not that God is able to give you a double portion. That's fine. You don't need to convince God of what God is able to do. What God is trying to get you to understand is what you are capable of. That nothing can kill you. It says it's not fair those who can kill the body. Or fair he who can keep both the spirit and the body in hell. Possessions can come and go. Husbands lose wives. Wives lose husbands. Life continues. Everybody's just going back home. But what is the Lord teaching me? Amen? Amen. And then let Luke 5 from verse 6 to 7. It says, when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break and they beckoned unto their partners. Oh, look, five, sorry, five, five. Master, we have toiled all night and done what? Taking nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. At thy word, he said. And this is the open mindedness of Peter that God saw. He says, we've done this a thousand times. I know there's nothing there, but nevertheless, even though it seems like a foolish instruction, I, thy word, I will let down the net. And what is the word Jesus has given to you and I in the book of John, 15 from 34? He says, a new commandment I give you, 
that ye love one another as I have loved you. That's the word. Love one another as I have loved you. Tirelessly, selflessly, without hypocrisy, in compassion, in humility, through humiliation. Looking at the interest of others above yourself as I have loved you. So I command you, he said. And he said, I requested it. So love one another. If you are doing it that way, raise your hand right now. And if you're not beloved in Christ, then how can you call yourself a Christian? What are we doing here? Just marking attendance? This is the commandment he has given us. If we're not doing it that way, then what is the point of it? And he says that ye also love one another. By this all men shall know that ye are my disciples if you love one another. He didn't say by raising the dead. He didn't say by being a great prayer warrior, by being a great preacher. He says if you love one another, men will know you are my disciples. So the calling to discipleship is stepping in into the love of Christ. And yet we make excuses. And see, here's the problem. We have been fooled into believing that the kingdom of heaven is just about hell and heaven. It's not. I've never been concerned about hell. Hell is probably not going to be the danger of most of us here. But there's a thing also worse than hell. When Paul talks about I have fought the good fight, I have run the good race, and I have got to lay hold of the crown in store for me. Do you think that crown was earned cheaply? We pray carelessly and give us the crown of salvation. Do you think the crown is given cheaply? Look at what Paul endured to get the crown. Look at what Peter endured to get the crown. Look at how much humiliation Christ endured. Even the death of the very people, his own death, at the hands of the very people he came to save. Before he could say, Father, now glorify me the glory I have. And you think you can just come and take the crown? Many will get into heaven. But many will get into heaven as servants and slaves again. And if you don't think it exists, believe me, it does. It does. It does. And it's one thing for you to live in the world in financial difficulty with the hope that things will be better there. But then to live in eternity... As a second class citizen, my father-in-law was talking about a friend of his. He said he passed away a few years ago and he said in a vision he was taken to go see him. There were two men who went to go see. The one was a very rich man in Nigeria who passed away, whom he thought would probably not make it. And he saw him in this beautiful mansion because the Lord talked about the good deeds of his heart and the goodness of his heart. And the man gave him a message to his family here. Then when he was leaving, he went to see another friend. And he said one was living in a castle. It was so beautiful. He said the pen he even gave him to write the message was completely diamond. And he put it in his pocket to leave. And then his friend said, hallelujah. He said, they don't have that pen where you're going back to. He took my pen back to me and gave, took it right out of his pocket. He said it was pure diamond. He has never seen anything look so beautiful. But the other friend he went to see, he said the room he was in, the entire house, was probably just this square place. The roof was thatched. The window was broken. The chairs were tattered. And he said to him, Ah, Oremi, my friend, what are you doing here? He said, this is what I could manage. For all eternity, we have to leave the shallow end, beloved, in Christ. That crown isn't cheap. We're getting home. 1 John 4 from 19 says, Luke 5, 6 to 7, as we're reading, it says, And when they had done this thing, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break, and they beckoned unto their partners, which were within the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled those ships, so that they began to what? They began to sink. And here was what the Lord was revealing here. He says, You cannot learn about God without being involved with other people. You have to invite other people. There is no way to get to righteousness without being tested amongst people. And he said one thing very interesting. He says seclusion secures holiness. Inclusion invokes righteousness. When you seclude yourself from people, you can get holiness. 
But in order to gain righteousness, you must be in the midst of people. The people who try you, who torment you, that is where righteousness is invoked. And if you look in the book of Luke 1, I think it's 17, it says, I have saved you that you may worship me in truth, in holiness, and in righteousness all the days of your life. So holiness is one thing. Because some of you can say, well, you know what? I just don't want to deal with people. I'm going to leave the church. Leave the church. Leave the church. Go live in the mountain with monks. Live in the jungle with animals. That's fine. You can get holiness because all you do is pray and worship God all day. But righteousness you can never gain unless you are amongst people. And holiness alone will not get you there. It says in holiness and righteousness we must serve him all the days of our life. Luke 1 from 72 to 76. So then what's the problem? At the end of the day, he also says in 1 John 4, he says, if any man, from verse 19, say, I love God and hate his brother, he is what? He is a liar. Because how can you love someone you have not seen when the person you see every day you cannot even love? So the demonstration of the righteousness of Christ comes in how you express it to your neighbor. I don't know about you, but these are the things that continue to concern me. Luke 5, 8. We're rounding up. Five minutes. When Simon Peter saw it, he said he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am what? A sinful man, O Lord. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. When you begin your transformation, and you start to look inwardly, instead of looking at other people, and every time something happens, whether a driver provokes you, whether a teacher provokes you in school, whether a colleague provokes you at work, whether somebody provokes you in church, whether a spouse or a child provokes you, when you start to look inwardly, instead of looking at those people, the first thing you'll say is, I'm unworthy. Domini non sum dinus. Lord, I am unworthy. This is what Peter said. Because now Peter was not looking at relative goodness, looking at the other people and saying, at least I'm not that bad. He saw Christ and looked at himself from the eyes of Christ and saw how wretched he was. Many of us say, oh Lord, you know I'm a sinner. I've sinned knowingly. I've sinned unknowingly. Sins of our fathers. Sins we have committed. Father, forgive us. He's so careless. There's no passion behind it. When you really feel it, it hurts you to your bone because you don't even want Christ to look at you. That's why you say, I am a sinful man away from me. When the centurion told Christ, I need you to heal my servant, Christ said, let us go. He said the same thing. Domini non sum dinus. Lord, I am unworthy to have you under my roof. Just speak the word. But because we are never really searching ourselves and looking at ourselves and our wretchedness related to Christ, we continue to give ourselves a pass mark. May God have mercy on us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Proverbs 8 from verse 4. Proverbs 8 from verse 4. Unto you, O men, I call. Unto you, O men, I call. And my voice is to the sons of man. And my voice is to the sons of man. O ye simple. O ye simple. Understand wisdom. Understand wisdom. And ye fools. And ye fools. Be ye of an understanding heart. Be ye of an understanding heart. Here, for I will speak of excellent things. Here, I will speak of excellent things. This is wisdom speaking. And the opening of my lips shall be the right thing. And the opening of my lips shall be the right things. I will speak only righteousness unto you. For my mouth shall speak truth. For my mouth shall speak truth. And wickedness. And wickedness it will and never. Yes. Thank you so much. God bless you. Let us give our hearts and our minds to wisdom. Because when you truly start to see from the eyes of Christ, you will see that everything is there for a purpose. You see, we come into the world and Satan convinces us that what we want is something different. We want pleasures. We want a house. We want money. We want a beautiful wife, a beautiful husband, beautiful children, a great this, a great that. And all those things that we want get us, you know how many pence they get us in heaven? Zero. It has nothing to do with righteousness. But God knows the only thing he's interested in is your soul. 
So if giving you a spouse that will provoke you is what will teach you patience, what will teach you humility, he will give you that. A spouse that is as stubborn as you are. And if he says it's going to take you 30 years to change, by God, your teacher will be there for 30 years to instruct you. Think about what the Lord is trying to tell us. And let's start to listen to our teachers. Listen to our circumstances. Not for what they are, but for what God wants them to invoke in us. That's the only way to come to him. The final verses of that Luke 5 says, And when they brought their ships to land, no, uh, from verse 10, it says, And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, henceforth thou shalt catch men. You cannot catch men, beloved in Christ, by preaching, by speaking to them about Christ, which many of us have mastered. You can only catch men by being the light of Christ. That's all Christ asks you to do. It's easy to preach. It's easy to quote Bible verses. It's easy to pray. But be the city on the hill. Be the lamp in the house that everybody will see and say, I want to go and know that Christ that person worships. This is how we pull Christ to us. Look at the sun. It lights the entire world. You can see by it. It heals the land. It helps vegetation prosper. It warms both man and animal and amphibians alike. And the sun never asks anything in return. It looks to God to replenish it. This is what God asks of you. Don't love your neighbor because you expect your neighbor to love you back. Don't measure the love back to your neighbor and say, well, this is what they give and this is how much I'll give. That has nothing to do with Christ. Give as you know Christ demands of you and turn to Christ for your replenishment. Give without expecting in return and turn to Christ for your replenishment. Forgive even before that person has asked for your forgiveness. This is what Christ is asking for. Show mercy and compassion. Be selfless. Be humble. Reduce yourself before people. Have no expectations. Don't accord yourself. Well, I deserve this. You deserve nothing. You deserve nothing by the grace of Christ. And that grace is given to you for one purpose and one purpose only. To demonstrate his love to the world. Finally, beloved in Christ. Finally. Really, really finally. See, this is the last week. Luke 5, 11. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I took the five minutes from the single. And when they had brought the ships to land. And when they had brought the ships to land. They forsook all. They forsook all. And followed him. And followed him. You see, a lot of us talk about forsaking all and following him. But I don't think we really understand it. In Luke 12 from 51, it says, I have not come to bring peace, but division. To set a man's house at variance. A father against his son. A daughter against a mother. A daughter-in-law <laughs> against a mother-in-law. Meaning you have to get to a point where you start to challenge your thinking so much. And you're no longer doing it because this is how my parents did it. You're no longer doing it because this is how you've always done it. You're doing it differently. And if anything sounds contrary to the teaching of Christ, you simply do not follow him. He said they left all. All the fish they had caught, everything they thought they had been looking for, they left all and did what? And followed him. And Luke 14 from 26, If any man come unto me, and hate not his father and mother and his wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And that's another part where we fail. We are so protective of our own soul. Well, I don't want to be hurt, so I'm not going to do this. I don't want to be insulted, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be doing this. I'm going to stay away from those people. But he says, if you don't hate your own soul, meaning you're not willing to even sacrifice your own pride, your own self-respect, for the sake of the love of Christ and the name of Christ, he says, you're not worthy of me. You can't call yourself my disciple. And I love this one in Luke 9 that says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. We think the cross is something we take once and that's the end of it. Uh, Lord, I suffer that tribulation. Why a different one? He says, take up your cross daily. Daily. The cross is heavy. The cross is trial. The cross is tribulation. The cross is humiliation. The cross is sacrifice. The cross is self-denial. The cross is Christ. And he says you must carry it anew daily. Learn from your teachers and what your teachers are instructing you. 
Let us leave the old Levitical priesthood and the laws and follow the new priesthood of Christ, which is the Spirit of Christ. If you're willing to change, Christ will change you. But Christ cannot enter a closed door. Start to search yourself. Instead of blaming others, what are you teaching me, O Lord? May the grace of God continue to abide with us all. Amen. Amen.